Good day, everyone. Welcome again to the series of lectures on uh, civil procedure. Our topic for today is Rule 9, Effect of Failure to Plead. Okay, so the policy is to lay down all your claims as well as all, all your defenses and objections in your pleading. Okay, now what is the effect if there are defenses and objections that were not pleaded upon in the answer or in the responsive pleading. The answer would be they are considered as wait. Section 1 of uh, Rule 9 uh, states that defenses and objections not pleaded either in the motion to dismiss or in the answer are deemed. However, when it appears from the pleadings that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter, when it appears from the pleadings that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter, that there is another action pending between the same parties for the same cause, or that the action is barred by prior judgment or by the statute of limitations, the court shall dismiss the claim. Okay, so as a general rule, all your defenses and objections must be raised in your answer. Okay, however, in the following cases, even if you have not raised the same in your answer, you are not barred from raising it later in another pleading. Example, lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter. Litis pendentia, meaning there is Another action be between the same parties for the same cause. Res judicata, that the action is barred by prior judgment. Prescription. Okay. So in these cases, okay, even if you have not raised them in your answer, you can still raise and invoke them later in the action. Any compulsory claim, cross-claim, which is not set up, is barred. A compulsory counterclaim or a cost claim not set up shall be barred. So all your defenses and objections, all your compulsory counterclaims or cross claims must be stated in wise they are deemed barred. There are exceptions, however, again to the omnibus motion rule. For it has no jurisdiction over the subject matter. There is another action pending between the same parties for the same cause. The action is barred by prior judgment. The action is barred by the statute of limitations. These are the only grounds that may be utilized and raised in a motion. Okay, as the rules stand now, these four grounds are the only grounds that you can raise in a motion to this. The court may also motu proprio dismiss the case on any of these grounds. So there is no need for a formal motion from the parties. If, for example, on the basis of the complaint itself, the court sees that the, the action has already prescribed, in that case, the court can, by itself, without waiting for any motion, dismiss the case. Or the, if the court sees, based on the pleadings, that it has no jurisdiction over the subject matter. The court can just dismiss the case even without waiting for any motion from the parties. What if the counterclaim or cross-claim uh, matured after the answer was already filed? Uh, according to the rules, a counterclaim or cross-claim which matured or was acquired by a party after serving his answer may be presented in a supplemental pleading before judgment with prior leave of court. Garcia versus Soriano. So in this case, um, subject to the provisions of Section 1 of Rule 9, a motion attacking a pleading shall include all objections available and all objections not included are deemed way. Um, Garcia versus Soriano tells us about the rationale or reason for this rule. 
It is to require the movement to raise all available grounds for relief in a single opportunity in order to avoid multiple and piecemeal objections. In this case, the second motion to quash raised additional arguments to support or amplify those contained in the first motion to quash, but which arguments were already available prior to and at the time of the filing of the first motion to quash. Thus, such additional arguments are deemed waived and can no longer be raised in the second motion to quash. City of Taguig. Okay, so in this case, uh, the exception to the omnibus motion rule, uh, even if these grounds are not pleaded in a motion attacking a judgment, such as a motion for reconsideration, they are not in play. Lack of jurisdiction may be invoked at any stage of the action. It is as much a cause for pursuing a motion for reconsideration as it is a petition for annulment of judgment. Default. Okay, so what, uh, what is default? What is a declaration of Section 3 of Rule 9 states that if the defendant fails to answer within the period fixed by the rules, which is generally 30 days from receipt of the sum, upon motion, the claiming party with notice to the defendant, the court shall proceed to render judgment granting the claimant such relief as his pleading may warrant. So that is the consequence of failure to file a responsive pleading or an answer within the period fixed by the rules. Okay? So if you fail to file an answer within the period fixed by the rules, the plaintiff may move that the defendant be declared in default. There has to be a motion okay, filed by the uh, plaintiff to declare the defendant in default with notice to the defendant. Okay? Now, if the de declaration of default is granted by the court, okay, what will be the effect? The court will then require the plaintiff to present evidence ex parte. So meaning the defendant will not have the opportunity to be present in the hearing, to object, to cross-examine, the witnesses of the plaintiff. But does it mean that the plaintiff will be exempted from presenting evidence and will be entitled to the relief demanded in the complaint? The answer is no. He still has to present evidence. He still has to prove his cause of action. The only difference is that the defendant will have no right to participate in the trial but he will be given notices of what happened in the trial, okay? So he will not have no right to object. He will not have no right to cross-examine. The presentation of evidence will be made ex parte before the branch clerk of court, okay? What, now, what is the effect of the order of default? A party in default shall be entitled to notices of subsequent proceedings but shall not take part in the trial. Okay. So that is actually the most important effect of a declaration of default. He will have no right to participate in the trial. Now, what if you later on discover that you were declared in default? What will be the remedy? The remedy will depend on what stage you discover the declaration of default. If it was discovered at the time when trial is still ongoing, you can move, file a motion to lift the order of default. Okay. A party declared in default may at any time after notice and before judgment file a motion under oath to set aside the order of default upon showing that his failure to answer was due to fraud accident, mistake, or excusable negligence, and that he has a meritorious defense. 
So the remedy is to file a motion to lift the order of the vote. That motion must be under oath. That motion must allege a meritorious defense. And that motion, motion must allege that your failure to answer was due to fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable neglect. What if there are several defendants? Some of the defendants did not answer, but some uh, fake filed their answer. Okay, that there is what is known. That is what is known as a partial default. When a pleading asserting a claim states a common cause of action against several defending parties, some of whom answer and the others fail to do so, the court shall try the case against all upon the answers thus filed and render judgment upon the evidence presented. So the, the answering defendants okay, will, uh, the answer of the defendants who submitted a responsive pleading will also benefit the non-answering defendants. It will uh, stand as the answer for all the defendants. Now, extent of relief to be awarded a judgment rendered against a party in default shall not exceed the amount or be different in time from that prayed for, nor award unliquidated damages. Okay. However, there are certain cases where, where defaults are not allowed. Example, in cases of declaration of nullity of marriage. If the depending party in an action for annulment or declaration of nullity of marriage, or for legal separation fails to answer, the court shall order the Solicitor General to investigate whether or not a collusion between the parties exists, and if there is no collusion, to intervene for the state in order to see to it that the evidence submitted is not fabricated. So in actions for declaration of nullity of marriage, legal separation, there is no declaration of default. Okay? In that case, the Solicitor General or the public prosecutor will be asked to make an investigation to determine whether or not pollution exists between the parties and to intervene in behalf of the state to ensure that the evidence is not fabricated. What are the requirements for a declaration of default? First, the defendant fails to answer within the required period. Second, there is a motion from the plaintiff. There is notice to the defendant of the motion. And there is proof of the failure to answer within the required period. Default also applies to an answer to permissive counterclaims, third, fourth party complaints, cross claim, and complaints in intervention. So if there is an, a permissive counterclaim in the answer, okay, the rules require uh, that uh, the uh, plaintiff has to answer the permissive counterclaim within the period set by the rules. If he does not uh, answer the permissive counterclaims, default, he may be declared in default with respect to the permissive counterclaim. The same is true with respect to third party complaints. So, if the third party defendant fails to file an answer within the required period, the third party defendant may also be declared in default, as well as the uh, cross claim defendant. Okay. The court cannot motu proprio declare the defendant in default. The declaration of default must be proceeded, preceded with a motion. Okay, so uh, there is always a requirement for a motion before a party may be declared in default. The court alone, without receiving any motion from the parties, cannot by itself declare the defendant in default. Again, there are instances when default is not allowed, one of which are in cases involving annulment or declaration of nullity of marriage. Another uh, instance is 
those which are covered by the revised rules of summary procedure in which declaration of default is a prohibited motion, the proper remedy is a, mo is a motion to render judgment based on the complaint. What is the effect of default as well as the remedies available? Upon declaration of the dependent in default, the court shall proceed to render judgment granting the claimant such relief as may be warranted in his plea. First, the first effect of a declaration of default is the plaintiff will be allowed to present evidence ex parte. The dependent will ha not have any right to participate in the trial except okay, for his right to be entitled to notices of subsequent proceedings. Again, uh, the fact that the dependent was declared in default does not automatically mean that the uh, a judgment will automatically be rendered in favor of the plaintiff. The plaintiff must still present evidence to prove his cause of action ex parte. Okay? What are the remedies to default orders or judgments? Okay? Um, if the default order was discovered um, any time before judgment, okay, then uh, the uh, defendant may file a motion to set aside or lift the order of default, okay? Uh, there is a requirement that the motion be under oath that the reason for uh, pay, for his failure to answer was due to fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable neglect, and that he has a meritorious defense. Okay. When the judgment is already rendered, but before it becomes final, you can file a motion for new trial under Rule 37. Again, uh, you, you must also cite the reason uh, or justification for the motion, which is fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence. Okay, when the judgment is already rendered, but it becomes but before it becomes final. On the, on, uh, you may file an appeal on the ground that the judgment is contrary to law or the evidence presented. Appeal may be resorted to even if no motion to set aside the order of default file. So there are actually two remedies available after the judgment was rendered but before finality of the judgment. You can ask for a motion for new trial or you can file an appeal. But when you file an appeal, okay, you lose your right to present evidence, meaning you're just attacking the judgment because it is contrary to law or the evidence presented. But if you file a motion for new trial, okay, if it is granted, then you will have the right to present evidence. Okay. Now, when the judgment has already attained by finality, okay, what are the is there a, a remedy available to the defendant? You can file a petition for relief from judgment or an annulment of judge. The remedies are mutually exclusive. Okay, a defendant declared in default may only avail of one of these remedies depending on the time when default declaration was discovered. Land Bank of the Philippines versus La Loma Columban. In this case, Land Bank filed a complaint for sum of money against La, Mo La Loma and the spouses moved to declare La Loma and the spouses Sapanta in default. Respondent filed their motion their motion to lift the order of default. Uh, they allege that Sapanta was unable to file an answer because Emmanuel was diagnosed with a disease that prevented him from consulting his lawyer. Uh, Section 3B, Rule 9, provides for the remedy of the parties who have been declared in default. Review of the records show that respondents 
failed to discharge the said burden. A party who alleges must prove the same, since it is the respondents who claim that Emmanuel's illness prevented the spouses, Samantha, from timely filing their answer, they have the burden to prove the same. Now, review of the records would show that the respondents failed to discharge the said burden. So the excusable neglect okay, must be demonstrated or proved by the movement, by the party who filed the motion to lift the order of law. Okay. Again, the effect of partial default, okay, if uh, an, the answer filed by any of the defendants shall inure to the benefit of all the defendants who are sued under a common cause of action. The case shall be tried against all upon the answer filed and all of them shall share a common fate in the action. Okay. Judgment by default. Again, declaration of default will not automatically entitle the plaintiff to a favorable judgment. The judgment will be based on the evidence presented ex parte. If the evidence is not sufficient to grant the relief, the complaint may still be dismissed. Okay. Now, an answer filed beyond the reglementary period may still be admitted if the defendant has not yet been declared in default and no prejudice is caused to the plaintiff. So what if there is uh, already a motion to declare the defendant in default because uh, of failure to file an answer? And there is also a motion which is filed by the defendant to admit the answer. So in that case, the court should resolve the subject motion okay, simultaneously. The motion to admit answer and the motion to declare the defendant in default. Bello versus Mark Antonio. So in this case, Bello filed a complaint for foreclosure of mortgage against Mark Antonio. Copies of the summons and the complaint were left to a certain Giovanna which is respondent's niece, because respondent was not home at that time. There was no responsive pleading file. Now, um, the upon motion, the respondent was declared in default. Before judgment was rendered, respondent found out about the case. Now, the respondent filed a motion to lift the order of default on the ground of defective service of some. Said motion was denied. The motion for reconsideration was likewise denied. Okay. Uh, the RTC ruled that respondents filing of the motion to lift as well as the motion for reconsideration amounted to a voluntary appearance which already vested it with jurisdiction over her person. Okay. That the defendant fails to file an answer may upon motion be declared by the court in default. A party in default loses his right to present his defense, control the proceedings, and examine or cross-examine with this. Nevertheless, the fact that a defendant has lost standing in court does not mean that he is left without any recourse to defend. As I've said, uh, he may file a motion to set aside the order of default any time for judgment. If judgment has already been rendered but it has not yet become final, he may file a motion for a new trial or he may also appeal from the judgment. If the judgment already attained finality, he may file a petition for relief or an annulment of judgment. While the respondent has been notified of the proceedings, she was deprived of the opportunity to be heard due to the trial court's insistence on the validity of the default, default order despite improper service of stuff. It was erroneous on the part of the RTC to insist on this allowing the defendant to, re, to defend her case. 
it is tantamount to a violation of respondent's right to due process, a violation of her right to be BDO versus Tansipek. To recap, upon being declared in default, Tansipek filed a motion for reconsideration of the default order. Respondent Tansipek's remedy against the order of default was erroneous. Respondent should have filed a motion to lift the order of default and not a motion for reconsideration. A motion to lift the order of default is different from an ordinary motion for reconsideration. Why? Because a motion to lift the order of default must be under oath and must allege that the ex, uh, that the failure to answer was due to fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable neglect, and that there must be an allegation of a meritorious defense. So the dismissal of the petition for certiorari assailing the denial of respondent Tansifex motion constitutes a bar to the retrial of the same issue of default under the doctrine of the law of the case. So you, when, when an order of default has been declared, okay, you don't file a motion for reconsideration. You file a motion to get the order of default. Lee versus Willie Parma. So in this case, the issue is whether the RTC erred whether the RTC erred in denying Louis Inter Enterprises motion to lift the order of default. A defendant who fails to answer within 15 days from service of someone either presents no defenses against the plaintiff's allegation or was prevented from filing his answer within the required period due to fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence. A defendant declared in default loses his standing in court, he is deprived of the right to take part in the trial, and forfeits his rights as a party litigant has no right to present evidence supporting his allegations, and has no right to control the proceedings or cross-examine witnesses. However, the defendant declared in default does not waive all of his rights. He still has a right to receive notice of subsequent proceedings. Default is not meant to punish the defendant, but to enforce the prompt filing of the answer to the complaint. It does not. It does make sense for a defendant without defenses and who accepts the correctness of the specific relief paid, paid for to forego the filing of the answer or any sort of intervention. For even if he did intervene, the result would be the same, since he would be unable to establish any good defense Having none in fact, judgment would inevitably go against him. For a defendant with good defenses, it would be unnatural for him not to set up properly and timely his defenses. Thus, it must be presumed that some insuperable cause prevented him from answering the complaint. A petition for certiorari may also be filed if the trial court declared the defendant in default with grave abuse of discretion. Depending on when the default was discovered and whether a default judgment was already rendered, a defendant declared in, de in default may avail of any of these remedies. The remedies against default become narrower as the trial nears judgment. The defendant enjoys the most liberality with a motion to set aside the order of default as he has no default judgment to contend with and he has the whole period before judgment to remedy this. <clears throat> Upon the grant of a motion to set aside the order of default, a 
upon the grant of a motion to set aside the order of default, motion, uh, a petition for relief from judgment, the defendant is given the chance to present his evidence against the plaintiff. With an appeal, the defendant has no right to present evidence and can only appeal the judgment for being contrary to plaintiff's evidence or the law. Should a defendant prefer to present evidence, he must file either a motion to set aside the order of default, motion for new trial, or a petition for relief from judgment. In this case, Louis Enterprises discovered its default before the RTC rendered judgment. Thus, it timely filed a motion to set aside the order of default, raising the ground of excusable neglect. Excusable negligence is one by which ordinary diligence and prudence could not have guarded against. The circumstances should be properly alleged and proved. In this case, we, we find that Louis Enterprises' failure to answer is inexcusable. Louis Council filed its motion to dismiss Four, day late, four days late and took one year from discovery of default to file a motion to set aside the order of default. Dewey Enterprises only conveniently blamed its counsel without offering any excuse for the late file. The defendant's motion to set aside the order of default must satisfy three conditions. First is the time element. The defendant must challenge the default order before judgment. Second, the defendant must have been prevented from filing his answer due to fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence. And third, he must have a meritorious defense. Heirs of Mangiat versus Court of Appeals. In this case, the petitioners filed the complaint against the respondent for quieting of title and cancellation of certificates of title. Petitioners moved. The summons was served on the respondent JDC through its employee, uh, Cholito. The sheriff's return did not describe the position of Cholito at hotel. Petitioners moved to have Butel declared in default for failure to file an answer and to allow them to present evidence ex parte. The trial court promulgated a partial decision against Butel. The issue is whether jurisdiction over Butel was validly acquired by the RTC through service of summons upon its employee, whose authority to do so does not appear from the sheriff's return. When a pleading asserting a claim states the common cause of action against several defending parties, some of whom answer and some do not, the court shall try the case against all upon the answers thus filed. Therefore, the answer filed by a defendant in order to the benefit of all the defendants, defaulted or not. It is not within the authority of the trial court to divide the case by pursuing it ex parte against the defaulted defendant and rendering a default judgment against it. Then proceeding to hear the case as to the non-defaulted defendant. This deprives the defaulted defendant of due process as it, it is denied the benefit of the answer and the evidence which could have been presented by its non-defaulted co-defendant. <clears throat> Medrano versus Rivera. So in this case, Medrano filed a complaint for quieting of title against Diaz. Rivera filed an answer with counterclaim on the ground that some of the defendants had executed a deed of renunciation of rights in his favor. Medrano filed a motion to expunge the answer with counterclaim of Rivera and to declare the defendants in default. The trial court gravely abused its discretion in refusing to allow De Vera to participate in the case and requiring him to file a motion to intervene. The trial court's approach is, is flawed.
because the bearer's interest is not independent of or severable from the interest of the defendant. The, the vera is a transferi pendente lite of the name defendant by virtue of the deed of renunciation of rights. His rights were derived from the name defendant, and as transferi, he would be bound by any judgment against his transfer. Thus, the vera's interest cannot be considered and tried separately from the interest of the name defendant. As there was a transferi pendente lite whose answer had already been admitted, the trial court should have tried the case on the basis of that answer. The default of the original defendant should not result in the presentation of evidence because De Vera filed an answer. The trial court should have tried the case based on De Vera's answer, which answer is deemed to have been adopted by the non-answering defendant. This would result in an anomaly wherein De Vera would be bound by a default judgment even if he had filed an answer and expressed a desire to participate in the case. In this case, De Vera is not a stranger but a transferi pendente lite. A transferi pendente lite is deemed joined in the pending action from the moment when the transfer of interest is perfected. His participation should have been allowed by due process consideration. Sablas versus Sablas. This is a complaint for judicial partition, inventory, and accounting. The spouses, the petitioner's spouses, were served with summons. They filed a motion for extension of time to file their answer. However, they filed their answer late. While the trial court observed that the answer was filed out of time, it admitted that the, ple the pleading because no motion to declare in default was filed. So the following day, the respondent filed a motion to declare the petitioners in default. It was denied by the court. Uh, respondent moved for reconsideration, but it was also de denied. The admission by the answer by the trial court was contrary to rules of procedure and constituted grave abuse of discretion according to the petition. Okay. In Sablas, uh, the Supreme Court laid down the elements of a valid declaration of fault. First, the court has validly acquired jurisdiction over the person of the defending party, either by service of summons or voluntary appearance. The defendant failed to file an answer. A motion to declare the defendant in default has been filed with notice to the defending party. Okay. The Supreme Court said it is within the sound discretion of the trial court to permit the defendant to file his answer and to be heard on the merits even after the period to file the answer expires. The rules of court provides for discretion on the part of the trial court, not only to extend the time, but also to allow an answer to be filed after the reglementary period. The defendant's answer should be admitted where it is filed before a declaration of default and no prejudice caused to the plaintiff. When the answer is filed beyond the reglementary period, but before the defendant is declared in default, and there is no showing that defendant intends to delay the case, the answer should be admitted. Okay, we now go to the case of Use versus Landbank. Again, the Supreme Court in this case reiterated that to admit or to reject an answer filed after the prescribed period is addressed to the sound discretion of the court. An answer should be admitted where it was filed before the defendant was declared in default and there was no prejudice caused to the plaintiff. A declaration of default, if proper, shall not issue unless the claiming party asks for it. Thus, the court cannot, motu proprio, declare a party in default. So that is, uh, that's all for effect of failure to plead under rule 9. Thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe.